most TED Talks are about changing the world. This is about doing something that might be even harder, not changing the world. A few years ago, I had what I describe as a midlife crisis meets a mid-career opportunity. I turned 50, I took a sabbatical from my job as a newspaper columnist, and I spent a year in our national parks. Before beginning that year, I went to Walpole, New Hampshire, and met with Dayton Duncan. Dayton is Ken Burns' longtime collaborator and friend. It was Dayton's idea to make America's Best Idea about our national parks, a documentary. Dayton told me a story about when he and Ken first became friends, and they realized one of the things they had in common was their favorite film, It's a Wonderful Life. When they were making America's Best Idea, they talked about how It's a Wonderful Life could apply to our national parks. In the movie, George Bailey gets his wish, and he never was born, which means that his, he wasn't there to save his brother, and charming Bedford Falls becomes Pottersville, and so on. What if, they said, our national parks had never been created? What would the rim of the Grand Canyon look like today? It would be lined with trophy homes, and you or I, unless we owned one of those homes or knew somebody who did, would never get to stand there in that spot and experience that glorious view. Yosemite Valley would be a gated community with 18-hole golf course, par three backing up to Half Dome. The Everglades would be shopping malls and subdivisions. Yellowstone would be geyser world. I thought about that a lot during the year I had in the parks. The, the National Park Service was about to turn 100 and celebrate its centennial. And I was fortunate enough to win this fellowship that allowed me to pursue basically a dream assignment, spend a year in the parks and try and answer one question. What is the future of the parks? What does the next 100 years hold? I had a plan. I was going to go to 12 parks, one a month, each one symbolizing a different issue for the future. I started the year January 1 atop Cadillac Mountain in Acadia in Maine with the first sunrise of another year in America. From there I would go to Yosemite and Yellowstone, tropical waters off the Florida Keys, in a desert in Arizona, partly because this desert is home to the swirl cactus, partly because it was home to my mom. My love of the national parks can be traced very easily to my mom and dad. This is, this is one of my favorite photos of them. Um, I'm not exactly sure when or where it was taken, um, but they look young and relaxed, so I think it was before me. <laughs> a nerdy kid who could... Uh, get excited about a book about rocks. <laughs> and then along came two little sisters. I'm not sure how my parents had the will or patience to pile three kids into a station wagon with no air conditioning, no radio, my sisters and I fighting in the back seat over the space, and drive across country. I know it wasn't always easy. My dad was a Baptist minister, but when he was setting up this pop-up camper, he would curse like the father in a Christmas story, <laughs> fighting with the furnace. They didn't have a lot of money, but I realize now what they gave us with those trips. I, I don't remember what I got for Christmas when I was nine years old, but I remember vividly a trip to the Redwoods that year. I can still picture the campsite. I can see the world's tallest trees, some of them 2,000 years old the stunning night skies, um, the sound lying in my pup tent of the wind and the trees, and the smell of that ancient forest in the morning mixed with the smell of my dad cooking pancakes for breakfast. So when I turned 50 and my family asked how I wanted to celebrate, I said I want to go camping like I did when I was a kid when I was my, about my daughter's age. I wanted her to experience that. And so we did. We didn't exactly turn back the clock to my childhood. Um, we flew to California. We got a rental car that had air conditioning and satellite radio. 
But when we, when we got to the Redwoods and rolled down the windows, it, just the smell of the place took me back decades. And so did seeing my mom read to her four grandkids the way I know she read to me and my two sisters. She found a favorite children's book in the gift shop, bought copies for each of the kids, and then in the campsite, read it aloud to them. Everybody needs a rock. I'm sorry for kids who don't have a rock for a friend. I'm sorry for kids who only have tricycles, bicycles, horses, elephants, goldfish, three-room playhouses, fire engines, wind-up dragons, and things like that if they don't have a rock for a friend. Like a lot of things in life, like that childhood trip, I didn't truly appreciate this trip or this moment until later. A few weeks into the next year, a few weeks after that first sunrise in Acadia, a doctor told my mom she was dying, that she had an inoperable cancer, and that she probably only had months to live. At first, this made this year, this project, traveling in the national park seem meaningless. But the more I thought about it, the more I talked to mom, who loved the national parks, who volunteered at Saguaro National Park, who had traveled to uh, about 100 national parks, it made it feel even more meaningful. She wanted me to stick with the plan, so I did. And in June, I was in Yellowstone, the world's first national park. My wife, Tony, and daughter, Mia, were able to make that trip with me. Um, we'd only been there a few hours, and Mia was upset about something. She was stomping down a path. I think parents can probably relate to childhood meltdowns. And I was behind her trying to think of something to say to calm her down. But by the time I caught up to her, something had already changed her mood. She was smiling. Remember that book Nana read to us, she said? And she held out her hand and showed me something. A rock. I suppose this is where I'm supposed to say, I gave her a lecture, I said, you know, we don't, we don't take anything from a national park. If everybody did that, <laughs> even something small, it's gonna change the place. <laughs> but I didn't say that. I just said, that's a very nice rock, and I'm sure Nana would be very happy that you remember the story. When people ask me, what's your favorite national park, I always say, I, I can't pick one. It changes, it's partly about the beauty and partly about the personal connection. I think it is for everybody, it's like that. So maybe it's Redwood, maybe it's Grand Canyon, maybe it's right here in our backyard, Timucuan. But at that moment in time, it probably was Yellowstone, and not just because of the bison and geysers, but because of my daughter and a rock. While I was in Yellowstone, I got a call from my sister, and she said, instead of flying back to Jacksonville, I think you better come straight to Tucson, to mom's house. My mom, the same woman who months earlier had been climbing the mountains in her backyard, was now confined to a hospital bed. We moved the bed near a big window so she could at least see those mountains. But after a few days, she wasn't even opening her eyes. So she loved to read, my, so my sister started reading to her everything from the number one ladies detective agency to the Bible. Eventually, I decided I should take a turn, so I looked at her bookshelf and pulled something down and started to read aloud to her. Everybody needs a rock, I began. When my dad died in 1996, uh, it was sudden, I remember wondering which is harder, to lose a loved one quickly or to watch their body slowly shut down. I still don't know. I just know that when my mom took her last breath, shortly before another beautiful sunrise in that desert, it made me think everybody needs a rock, even adults. And not just a metaphorical rock like faith or friends, those are certainly useful, but there's something to be said for a real rock. That year that I began, January 1, atop Cadillac Mountain, standing on the pink granite there, I ended December 31st with the sunset atop Haleakala in Hawaii 
and the volcanic rock there. In between, there are lots of rocks, a granite half dome in Yosemite, the mile deep walls of the Grand Canyon, layers upon layers of rock charting billions of years, a 17-ton boulder in a Pennsylvania field marking the spot where a plane crashed on September 11th. A small red stone in the rainforest of Olympic National Park marking what has been described as one of the last quiet places on Earth. These are places of solace, places that to go disconnect and reconnect with what truly matters. Not, not just for me during that year, for millions of people every year, for us as a nation. We need places like this more than ever, and more than ever, places like this are under attack. I could give you a long list of the threats, everything from rising seas to shrinking budgets. It's tempting, very tempting, to point at politicians some who seem to have little or no connection to our parks, some who seem hell-bent on dismantling environmental protections and in opening up public lands to private development. But the biggest threat isn't them, it's us, those of us who say we love the parks. And not the age-old, are we loving them to death? Are we loving them enough to keep them alive? When I began that year, I thought that whenever America created a national park, at that moment in time, we protected it forever, locked it up, and threw away the key. I now realize that is something that has to happen again and again, day after day, generation after generation. Most TED Talks end with someone explaining how they hope you will help them change the world. I'm hoping, like George Bailey, at the end of It's a Wonderful Life, you'll appreciate what you have, what we all have, and fight to protect it and pass it on to the next generation. The small town where I grew up has changed. If I took my daughter back there, I'd have to say, this is what used to be over here. This is what used to be over there. But if I take her to the Redwoods, she can smell some of the same smells as she hikes some of the same trails, play in some of the same tide pools, hug some of the same trees, maybe even find her rock. I'm hoping that in another 100 years, our children's children will be able to go to the rim of the Grand Canyon and see the view, that view without the trophy home that made Teddy Roosevelt say, leave it as it is. That they'll be able to go to Olympic National Park and hear that quiet. That they'll go to Big Bend and see the stars and that they'll be able to follow the sun from Maine to Hawaii and along the way find a rock.